All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, my name is Dan Stackhouse. I'm the Director of Development for the Library of Virginia Foundation. Um, and it is a pleasure to see everybody um, out here on what we worried was going to be the perfect storm of a bad day to have a book talk with you. Tuesday after Labor Day, when everyone's back at work, kids are back at school, and it's been raining all day. So, uh, But it's great to see such a great crowd here today. And uh, Is anybody here at the Library of Virginia for the very first time ever? Tell people. First book talk. Wonderful. We're, we're so thrilled to have everybody here. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we are with the, I'm with the Library of Virginia Foundation. We are the uh, private uh, 501c3 nonprofit that supports the efforts of the Library of Virginia. Um, we uh, support efforts like education programs, like this book talk, the, the Literary Awards celebration. Um, we assist with some of the exhibitions programs, including the wonderful, if you haven't seen it yet, the wonderful Poe, Man, Myth, or Monster exhibition, which if you haven't seen it, I would definitely encourage you to take a few minutes uh, after this talk and work your way through it. It really is uh, pretty spectacular. Um, I would ask that you uh, take a couple minutes. Please uh, turn off your cell phones, pagers, things like that, if you have not already. Um, we will have a brief uh, question and answer session with Professor Roy after, we're, uh, after the talk, and then we will all retire out to the lobby where we have uh, copies of her book for sale, and also um, we'll have a chance to uh, you'll have a chance to get your book autographed. Um, we also hopefully saw on the way in uh, the chance to sign up for a copy, a chance to win a copy of the book. We'll be doing the drawing right here at the end um, before we all retire out to the lobby. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Peggy Bellows. Peggy is the managing editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch. We are very, very fortunate to have a wonderful relationship with the Richmond Times Dispatch uh, and with Media General. They are great media partners with us, a great way to spread the word. They've uh, maintained their commitment to books and authors in Virginia. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have them as a partner. And uh, Ms. Bellows is uh, going to introduce Professor Roy today. So thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see that we've all braved the weather to be down here today. Um, Lucinda Roy is an alumni distinguished professor at Virginia Tech, where she began teaching in 1985. She is the author of the novels Lady Moses and the Hotel Alleluia and two poetry collections. She is also the recipient of numerous writing and teaching awards, including a statewide outstanding faculty award in 2005. From 2002 to 2006, Professor Roy served as chair of Virginia Tech's Department of English. Today, Professor Roy will discuss her latest work, No Right to Remain Silent, the first comprehensive account of the April 16, 2007 tragedy at Virginia Tech. Publishers Weekly said, quote, Roy's book takes an unflinching look at Seng Wee Cho, the day's horrific events, and the university's role in warning students and recovering afterward. Roy is driven by a responsibility to tear down the Tech Administration's wall of silence. The book raises important issues regarding the limits of privacy, where a family's duties end and a school's begin, and how likely it is that more rigorous attention could lead to unnecessary suspensions and expulsions. Well, with that set up, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Roy. Um, I've tried to read this book a couple different times, and um, I can't read it. I told, this, I told her that. Every time I try to read it, it ends the same way, with it in my lap and me in tears. There's just so much pain and so much truth that needs to be told. And I'm interested to hear Professor Roy's, what she found out when she went looking for truth on campus. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me OK? Um, this isn't an easy book to read. Um, I would like to thank the Library of Virginia um, for having me here today. I really do appreciate it, and also the Richmond Times Dispatch for sponsoring um, these sessions. Um, it's always difficult to know what to read from a book like this because I'm not sure how much all of you know. So what I'm going to do is read just a few different excerpts and try to kind of bring you up to date with what seems to be going on and then leave enough time for questions at the end. I hope that sounds okay. Does it sound okay? Okay. All right, firstly, um, why I wrote this book. One of the main reasons why I did was because I really do feel that there are things we can learn from this. 
We either bury our heads in the sand and say it's never going to happen again, knowing that it will, and it has, or we say there are things that we can learn that we, if we look at it with really clear eyes and try to look at it as objectively as possible. It's extremely difficult to do if you are involved in it, however. So trying to step back and, and gain some perspective is really important. Um, it seems to me also that there must be a counter-narrative to the one that Sung Wee Cho himself um, has uh, posted now so, so often, or been posted uh, on his behalf, because there are many young people out there, when you start to do research for a book like this, you find all kinds of angry young people who want to top his tally, and they boast about doing that. So there must be some other narrative that is told that can counter that kind of trend. I thought maybe the best thing to do was to begin by reading an excerpt from the prologue. Um, I should say to you that there's only one paragraph in this whole book that really describes the shootings in any detail, and that's the opening paragraph of the prologue. Um, I felt I needed to do that for those who didn't know about what had, had happened. At the same time, this is not a book that dwells upon the bloodshed. It seems to me that many people will be writing those kinds of gory books, and it wasn't the kind of thing that I wanted to do. This is about learning from what happened. That Monday, was one of the bit most bitterly cold and blustery April days we had seen in Blacksburg for some time. In the 2006 to 2007 academic year, more than 26,000 students had come to Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, known simply as Virginia Tech, to learn. Surrounded by a breathtakingly beautiful 2,600-acre campus in rural southwestern Virginia, it seemed to be a place of abiding tranquility. Students could learn, and teachers could teach here in peace. Eighteen months before the shootings, while serving as the chair of the English department at Virginia Tech, I worked one-on-one -on -one with Sung Wee Cho, and after professor and poet Nikki Giovanni asked that he be removed from her class. During that time, I tried to get him help. When I met with Cho in the fall of 2005, he seemed to acknowledge that he needed to seek assistance to deal with his depression. Towards the end of that semester, he repeatedly contacted the Cook Counseling Center and even contacted the person that I had recommended which provides free on-campus counseling services to students at Virginia Tech. According to mass shootings at Virginia Tech report of the review panel, here and after referred to as the panel report, completed in August 2007 by a panel appointed by Governor Timothy M. Cain, the response Sung Wee Cho received was tragically inadequate. Even after he actively sought tr help, treatment was not admit administered by the Cook Counseling Center, nor did Cho receive follow-up treatment from on-campus or local counseling services following the order by a judge that he be treated on an outpatient basis. According to the panel report, there had been numerous red flags, but none of them had resulted in a comprehensive evaluation or a coordinated response. In the wake of the tragedy, the response from faculty, staff, and alumni was remarkable. The town of Blacksburg embraced the university community and helped many of us get through some of the toughest times we have ever known. This was coupled with a tremendous outpouring of sympathy from around the world. But unfortunately, the story is not simply one of heroism, endurance, and sympathy. It is more complicated and more human than that. It is about what preceded and what followed the tragedy as much as it is about the tragedy itself. It always seems to me that those are the most important questions you ask. Of course people are not always going to react particularly well in a tragedy when they're, they're in a, a crisis situation, especially if they're not trained to do that. So then you ask, well, what was it like before? the tragedy. How did Virginia Tech deal with troubled students? Uh, in fact, Virginia Tech had a troubled history with troubled students, in my opinion. Um, how did they deal with things afterwards? Was there an attempt to understand what had happened? Um, in the one and a half years that followed the tragedy, I was never, and actually I've still never been asked, a single question by the Virginia Tech administration about Sun Wee Cho. Nor has anybody else, I believe, who talked to him. I find that to be surprising, to say the least. 
I have answered questions um, for the police because I've gone and volunteered that information. And I also had a 30-minute interview with the panel review board, two members of that board. Unfortunately, during that interview, um, the president felt it was necessary to send his um, attorney to the, to the interview, so I wasn't permitted to speak very much um, when I was speaking with the panelists. So there's a great deal that is not yet known about what occurred at Virginia Tech. And I don't say this in any kind of spiteful or malicious way. I want to make it absolutely clear, as this is being recorded, this is not malicious. I have been warned that if I am willful, wanton, or malicious, I will lose representation. So I have to be careful about how I say things, because I don't want to be thought of as malicious. Uh, at the same time, I do want to be thought of as truthful. So it seems to me that some of these things need to be told. So the story is not simply one of heroism. Sung Wee Cho presents us with a series of difficult challenges. The sheer brutality of what occurred is overwhelming. And that really is the thing that stops us. Because those of us who remember that morning and remember the, the time after that, it is so full of anguish that even turning to it to try to examine it can be very difficult. This tragedy forces us to address some of the most pressing issues of our time. Education, parenting, violence, youth subcultures, communication, censorship, mental health, gun control, and race. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that the debate has often been explosive. The story, hard as it is to tell, is as relevant to kindergarten through 12th grade, K-12, as it is to higher education. Teachers at every level and parents of children at every age face similar challenges. One of the most remarkable things that happened to me after this occurred, and I detail this later on in the book, is that I heard from thousands of people. And many of the people who wrote to me felt, I think, that they could confide in me because I'd been through something similar. And they wrote about the fact that they had a son, for example, and they would say, my son is just like Sun Wee Cho, and I know someday he's going to kill people. And I have tried to reach out for help, I've tried to get help, and I cannot even get him committed, that nobody will do that. Um, I've had to lie and say that he's going to commit suicide, and then sometimes I can get help. I heard from teachers who were worried about students as young as six years old bringing guns to school. Um, we've got so accustomed to hearing about that that even the, the incidents we've had in the past couple of weeks where there was a gun on a school bus and another incident where a teacher bravely tackled a student and uh, he'd come to school with pipe bombs and uh, ammo and guns and so on. We don't even report that very much anymore because we expect that that kind of thing is going to happen. It is vital when we look at a tragedy like this that we rid ourselves of our assumptions and biases before we try to come up with solutions. We need to ask what actually happened. And I do have to say here that it seems to me that uh, the paper that did dare to ask that was the Richmond Times-Dispatch. And I did get um, a lot of helpful information from that paper while I was doing research for this. It's been extremely difficult for the Roanoke Times to comment on this tragedy in any other way except to try to um, be as supportive of Virginia Tech as it feels it can be, and therefore very supportive of the administration. They're in a very difficult position, and so it's been hard for them. The Richmond Times-Dispatch has asked some of the questions that do need to be asked, I think. Um, as you may know, in that two-hour delay, um, originally we were told that after the first double homicide, um, there was no immediate response because a suspect had been uh, but I positively identified, essentially. And so, of course, they were uh, going after that suspect. As it turns out, however, there was a 46-minute delay between the identification of the suspect. And it seems as though during that time, um, no warnings really went out. It's also true, it seems, as though there were selective lockdowns for some people. So some people did learn that they needed to lock themselves down and others didn't. And this is particularly painful for the families, as you can imagine, because some of them had children who had not left their dorm room yet and actually wouldn't have gone to class. So um, 
that's such a key question. I think the thing that surprised me most when I really started to study the panel report, and I think most people haven't really studied it except for Dave Ress and others at the Richmond Times-Dispatch, um, there, there is no voice from the president really in that, in that report. There's no accounting of what really happened during that time. And it seems to me it's absolutely fair to ask of leaders Please, will you let us know what happened? And instead, on his behalf, David Ford speaks. And, and David Ford, at the time, was probably the lowest ranking member of the policy group that made the decision um, not to warn the campus. So it seems to me that one of the things that we'll learn, because there are two lawsuits pending, is what really um, President Steger knew. And I think that that will be a healthy thing for the campus. I think it's something that we do need to know about if we're going to proceed. So. We need to ask what actually happened. What do we know about Cho and about the culture at Virginia Tech? What do other school shootings teach us about students? What can we learn from teachers, parents, and students themselves? Knee-jerk reactions are not helpful, and silence is less helpful still. We need to be open to the idea that contradiction may lie at the heart of this issue, and that any solutions which do not take this into account will fail. In middle school, Cho was diagnosed with selective mutism, an anxiety disorder that affects one's ability to speak in certain social situations. After the tragedy, it seemed to me that his condition was contagious. It was as if a collective selective mutism had descended upon an administration determined to keep silent in the face of harsh criticism. Terrified of litigation, quite rightly by the way, of course they were terrified of litigation, terrified of the press, uh, it's horrible when you speak to the media, no offence meant to the Richmond Times Dispatch, but if you do do that, you will be hung up, to, out to dry in all kinds of ways, and your words will come back to haunt you, and they will be taken out of context, and you will be misquoted. It is terrifying to have to, as I did, wake up uh, that next morning and have um, people pounding on the door, the phone not stopping ringing for days, um, it may be a 20-second gap, but that was about it. And so the media itself sometimes can lead to a kind of silencing of the community if we're not careful, because people just go underground, they're terrified. Terrified of litigation embroiled in a controversy about the infamous two-hour delay in notifying a campus, a president and his advisory team circled the wagons. No one was permitted to inter interrogate the specifics of the tragedy itself, and there was even resistance to attempts made by Governor Kane's panel review board to find out what had happened. Uh, so there are all kinds of things that swirl around this incident that are to do with Richmond, actually, that are interesting. One of the things that would be interesting, for example, would be to find out what exactly Virginia Tech was told by the governor's office and the attorney general's office when they called saying that there had been a double homicide. Were they advised not to close the campus? I mean, it's never really been too clear. We're not, we're not quite sure what happened. Um, later on, some of us in the English department um, who had taught Cho were told that all of, our, all of our work, including all of our scholarship, had to be imaged and uh, the administration would keep it and hold on to it just in case there was any litigation. We resisted. Uh, we wanted to give all kinds of information, which we did, um, about the incident, but I was very concerned about some of the things I had on my computer because I knew about a faculty member getting cancer, for example, who had told me in confidence. I knew some faculty members and staff members who were very, very dismayed with the current administration at Virginia Tech. I needed to protect them. Unfortu and then there was another issue, and that was the fact that security is so bad at Virginia Tech when it comes to electronic data. So we wanted some assurance that it would be safe. When we questioned them and asked if we could have assurance, um, I was... Uh, let's see what exactly happened here. We found out that there had been a memo sent to the, the Virginia Tech attorneys and the Virginia Tech attorneys presented this memo to us and I actually include it in the book and quote from the whole thing. And what's particularly interesting and topical is that the memo, uh, the name on the top of the memo is Bob McDonald's name, um, which I think is interesting because of course he's running right now for the governor's office. 
Um, I would be, I would love to find out whether he was the one who wrote this memo or whether it really was Ron C. Forehand, um, which really seems like a wonderful name for the person who, who was going to punish us for not handing things over immediately. But this was what the memo said. So remember, this comes a few months after the shooting. We're devastated. Um, we know that um, we haven't been asked questions about what's going on. Um, and we know that um, the administration in particular is, is, is very angry with me because I did step forward and say that I had reported Cho. So I felt terrible because all of the English department members who taught Song Wee Cho were being singled out, I felt, because of the fact that I'd reported troubled students. No other professor in any other department who taught him was asked to undergo this imaging process, only us. So this is what the memo said. Employees who refuse access to Virginia Tech-owned electronic equipment for this data preservation project may be subject to a range of sanctions to include discipline, including discharge, and denial of a defense by the Attorney General's office in the event litigation is filed as a result of April 16th. In the event an employee is not cooperative, I suggest that the university simply confiscate the equipment, take appropriate action in respect to copying, and then take appropriate personnel action against the resistant employee. I'd be happy to speak personally, this is Ron C. Forehand under uh, Bob McDonnell, to any employee should that be necessary. Please know that you, the legal department and the university have the full support of the Office of the Attorney General in your endeavors. That's addressed to the Virginia Tech attorneys. And indeed the thing that was always impressed upon me was that um, the Attorney General's office in Richmond was acting very much in concert with the attorneys at Virginia Tech. What is difficult, and I wrote an op-ed for the Richmond Times a, a few weeks ago about this issue, is that this means that those representing us at Virginia Tech, are, it's the same office that was there in the room when the decision was made not to close campus. And in fact, one of the attorneys has been named in the lawsuit. So you're getting advice from the person who needs to defend herself. It doesn't matter how good that person is. And I know most of these people, by the way. I've been friends with them for a long, long time. And so, of course, I hate even saying this, but it's crazy to think that there wouldn't be a conflict of interest. How blind do we have to be to think that we can be objective when we're trying to defend ourselves? I mean, to some extent, we can't be. So very, very hard to try to represent other people. There's a section in this book um, that is the hardest to read, probably, and it's about Sung Wee Cho when he would come to see me. I was going. To, I will read uh, a page or two from there, but I wanted to ask if there was anyone who would object to my doing that. I don't know if I've got family members here or victims or anyone who would find it difficult because I can easily omit it. Is there anyone who would be uncomfortable with my reading that? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do it then. And this is in the fall of 2005. I probably should take a drink of water first. <laughs> this is when Cho comes into my office. And he, I've, I've already interviewed him for quite a long time. I've taught him before, the semester before, in a very large class. But I've never really worked with, with him one-on-one -on -one before. My whole goal here is to get him to go to a counselor. I've been told the only other alternative I have is to take him out of the class where he wrote the angry poem and put him in another class. I don't feel that that's right to do that because I'm worried about his mental state, so therefore I uh, volunteer to tutor him myself and try to get him to go to counseling. Each time he walks into my office, I am seized with the desire to fill the void he creates. There is something melodramatic about his entrance. He knows what impression he is creating and it seems to give him satisfaction. As a result, I talk a lot. It is partly nerves but it's also because I want him to grow accustomed to my voice. Sometimes it's like talking to an inanimate object with limbs and an attitude. The core of his identity is impenetrable, his gaze strangely neutered, as if he has spent his entire life ridding it of its expression. At first, I don't think he's listening, but gradually I learn I am wrong. He has been paying very close attention from the beginning, 
I know this because every so often he will relay back to me things I told him, things he learned in the poetry class he took with me 18 months ago. He remembers the poems we studied by Emily Dickinson, William Shakespeare, James Wright, Mary Oliver, and Robert Hayden. He remembers the poetic forms and techniques we talked about. He aches to write fiction, but I know he is not ready to write the novel he seems to dream about because there is a part of him that appears to be profoundly immature. In the middle of his deliberate stillness, there is an urgency that refuses to be patient. His egotism and insecurity create a dangerous combination because then he can ridicule everything that intimidates him. It is a character combination that is essentially dismissive of others. He is uncomfortable when challenged about his ideas, and yet he seems to yearn to be challenged, hoping that someone will topple the despair that colors what he sees. Sung doesn't seem to be as resentful as he was when we had our very first meeting together. He doesn't shuffle in and sit down on the chair like someone who is daring you to find fault with him. His hands tremble once in a while, even though he's used to me by now. I'm nervous myself. I always am at the beginning of our sessions, but I need to focus on the student in front of me. I need to have my wits about me when I meet with him because the indicators he gives me about who he is are few and far between. I have spoken with him before about my own shyness, explained how I used to be physically sick before I had to make a presentation, told him about the stutter I have that can disappear for weeks, months even, then reappear when I least expect it to. His expression registers surprise at this disclosure, as if it hadn't occurred to him that I could suffer from a lack of confidence. When we speak about things like this, he will answer in full sentences, though still softly. His sunglasses appear to be an important part of his identity, and now that I have come to understand this, I am even more careful when I ask him to remove them. I let him know that I would like to see his eyes, but that we can still talk, even if he doesn't comply. I am relieved when he does so without much hesitation or discomfort. He still seems wary of me at times, as if he expects me to hurt him. Once in a while I see a flicker of what seems to be anger or resentment, but this passes quickly and has become rare. Sometimes when we're writing together, he almost cowers in his chair. At other times, especially in the first few minutes of a session, he is utterly still and wears a sullen, defiant expression. Mine is a corner office, one of the few perks I receive for serving as chair. It's fairly spacious as faculty offices go, measuring roughly 14 by 14, but when some we Cho enters, the room seems to shrink to the size of a cubicle, not because he is a particularly large person, but because there is something about him that sucks up space and brings you into closer proximity with him. He has the capacity to drain energy from a room, calling attention to himself, through his studied silence. During the first session we had alone together, there were few words. It was extremely difficult to know what to make of him, and I was not surprised that he was able to intimidate people. His silence seems at times to be cultivated, an affectation of sorts. Perhaps because of this, it has the capacity to turn itself into its opposite, to become a kind of muffled scream. If I were to paint a portrait of Sun Wee Cho as he sits opposite me, it would not be so much a portrait as a still life. At first glance, he would appear to be more absence than presence. The figure in the center of the canvas would seem to float in negative space. The face would be bereft of expression, just a pair of sunglasses fused to rock. The faces of those of us who happen to be caught in his sight, distorted, then reflected back at us. The presence wouldn't be mocking because mockery suggests some kind of ironic connection between subject and object, some kind of communion. Instead, the presence would be supremely, utterly indifferent, his gaze as blank and pitiless as the one described by Yeats in his haunting poem, The Second Coming. But here's the catch. Looking at the painting, you would be filled with an indefinable sorrow because you would suspect that it was impossible for the subject to penetrate his own darkness. Um, it, when I was trying to write about who Cho seemed to be, one of the things that I had was his work. He wrote a Sestina, 
and also a novel and he shared um, this section of the novel with me so I was able to look at that. Um, I didn't see the most disturbing work that he wrote um, uh, and I didn't learn about that until uh, after the tragedy. Um, but I was worried enough about him that I'd contacted the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, Student Affairs, the Virginia Tech Police Office, um, Police Department, and also the Cook Counseling Center. Um, I'd had another incident that spring with a student who actually was even more frightening to many of us than Sun Wee Cho. And unfortunately, that had ended in disaster um, in lots of ways, not as disastrous as we came to learn it would end with, with Cho, but with this other student, and I call the student Student A in the book, um, he had uh, got a fetish, it seemed, for rape and for um, cutting off uh, anything that was negroid in uh, somebody's features, so it was particularly worrying, of course, for somebody who is a person of color, as, as I am, uh, to read the kind of things that he was writing. Almost always the, the main topic was rape and mutilation. And he was an older student, he had a toddler. It was very difficult for to try to get help for this student uh, because he didn't seem to feel that he needed it. Um, in the end, uh, I called over to the police department and said, you know, what are we going to do? He still wants to turn these things into class. He wants the, all the class to read them, which is what happens in a workshop. And I was told that what I could do was just meet with him in my office and then have the police come and ask whether he would go voluntarily to be assessed. I knew it was a dangerous thing to do, but I couldn't think of any other thing to do because by then the faculty were so nervous. Two of them were refusing to teach him. So I invited him to my office and the police came and he did go voluntarily and I was so relieved I thought, he knows he needs help. About an hour or two later I got a call from the faculty member who had asked for security in his class if the student ever showed up. The student was out and he was there in the class and the faculty member said to me, I mean he was panicked, he said, what, what am I going to do? And I said, there must have been some kind of mix up. I will call over to the police and get help. I called over to the police and they said they were short staffed and there wasn't anything that they could do. So I sent my husband rushing over to his classroom, then I rushed over myself and uh, I do want to tell you, this seems as though it's so extreme, how could this be going on? I have heard from many, many people who are going through similar things. This is a national problem. This is not just about Virginia Tech. This is why we don't have the right to remain silent, because this is recurring over and over and over again, and we need to find a way to deal with it. The last thing I'd like to read to you, because I want to make sure there's enough time for questions, is, is more uplifting, I hope. Um, it's the uh, section from the anniversary, and it's about trying to come to terms with what happened, because in many ways this is what I call a memoir critique, where I'm critiquing what went on, but also trying to be true to my memory of what happened. And it's a, it's a hard book to do, to try and get that balance, but uh, I think, I hope in the anniversary chapter that's something um, I'm doing. We just, this is at the anniversary and we're all on the drill field and it's the first anniversary after the shootings. We disperse for a few hours then gather again that evening for the candlelight vigil on the drill field. It was the photos of the vigil after the shootings last year that most of us remember, how thousands of candles flickered as we tried to grasp what had happened. Tonight, each of us is given a candle that has been thrust through a hole in the bottom of a red paper cup. The paper cup I am given has a Coca-Cola logo emblazoned upon it. Others, too, seem to be stamped with advertisements for Coke or Pepsi. American enterprise cannot be quelled by something as unprofitable as grief. I wonder if my cup was donated I wish that the corporation had thought to cover its own logo with our own logo of grief, the way people at other universities and other countries did when they mourned in unison with us. It would have been a fitting way to pay tribute to something more significant than money. But I decide that instead of complaining about things I cannot change, it is better simply to take the cup which has been offered, just as the child nearby does, and hold up my embedded candle with the rest. It's dark now anyway, 
So what does it matter what's on the side of my flimsy cup? All that matters is what the candles symbolize tonight. My husband Larry and I watch as our candles' flickering lights join hands with the lights of thousands and thousands of others in our community. When we hold them up against the dark, we are bobbing on an ocean of illumination. Something inside me opens up and tries to bloom. Its petals are small, nothing like the blooms on the Japanese cherry tree in our front yard that is only just beginning to unsheath itself. And then the bugle sounds out taps. And wouldn't you know that someone has thought to include a literal representation of what it means to reflect upon and echo each other's voices. One of the bugle players has been stationed at the site of the 32 stones, always only 32, while another has been stationed a few hundred yards away at the War Memorial Chapel to answer the call. The chapel, where so many people from our community have been honored before, is a place where tragedy is proverbial. The site of old loss is joined to the site of new loss, and the thread, the note that links them together, is the sound of light shimmering across the dark. The young students in military uniform play, we listen. Things lost can come back to us in another form. Translation and metamorphosis do not have to be brutal. And thus, on this day one year later, I am persuaded that tragedy doesn't end with silence, but with song. The beautiful faces of the beloved dead are resurrected. Our dead call to us. The survivors must respond. By their blessed light, we can learn to listen to each other all over again. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I left enough uh, time for questions, so uh, if you have questions, please just, you, thank you. It was funny, I got a call uh, a couple of weeks before the book was due to come out. The, the question was, did anybody in the administration ask to review the book before it was published? Um, and uh, the, the call came from the Office of Recovery and Support. And the person asked me, uh, I try not to reveal names in the book, by the way, because uh, I, often people are being asked to do things. It's not that they want to do them, they're, they're being asked. And uh, she asked me if I would uh, just not bring the book out before April 16th. She said, if I did it after that, I wouldn't offend the families so much. The families, I think, had been told by some people that the book was, um, you know, exploitative and that I was going to take money for the book and so on and they didn't know what the real uh, situation was so of course some of them felt that this shouldn't be written. Um, subsequently I've been very fortunate in that some of the family members, quite a few have contacted me and I've uh, that's been one of the most rewarding things actually. Uh, the, the, the emphasis was not to publish before April 16th, but as long as it came out afterwards, the families wouldn't have such a problem with it, which seemed to me to be strange. Um, and it, it may just have been coincidental that that was the last day that you could file a lawsuit, April 16th, one year afterwards. But it also may not have been coincidental. So, uh, But the person who called me, I'm not sure she would have known that at all. I think she was just told to call. And that was the only time, really. Oh, no, no, and then I got a few more emails before that that I have conveniently forgotten, uh, where, where people in the administration said, uh, we are going to be asked questions about the book, so we need to know what's in it. And my response was, I haven't shown the book to anyone. This is a really private thing. I haven't shown it to the family members either. And I didn't want to do that because I really wanted the book to be an objective book, as much as it could be. It's about my experience. I only uh, detail those things that I have first-hand knowledge about um, or that are very evident there in the panel report. Um, but uh, it created a difficult situation. But I do want to emphasize, in fact, almost everyone at Virginia Tech has been incredibly supportive. It really is just two or three people who are very nervous about all of this. But it's important to remember that 
that silence can be enforced. I mean, it's very easy to make people so terrified that they're not going to speak. You can lose your health care because you've lost your job. Um, I know I'm looking around now, I have to unfortunately uh, look around probably for another position because I don't know how, how difficult things will be for my department in future. Um, even if I'm difficult to touch, and apparently I'm not, because tenure was thrown out of the window, it seems, with, with Ron C. Forehand's forehand. So uh, I would really love to know who that guy is. He's not here, is he, Ron C. Forehand? Because I've been trying to find out. Uh, I know he works in the, uh, I forget which department, but anyway, uh, he, he seems to be, to have a very strong um, rhetorical voice. And uh, it would be nice to find out uh, who was actually behind that. I have asked if that could be, that some kind of apology could be issued for that, because to threaten people with, with firing is really so unfortunate. Um, but I've been told by the university that it came directly from Richmond, that they had nothing to do with it, that in fact, um, so there's no way that they can reverse that. So it's interesting, yes. Prevent what? You know, I think from when you start to do the research on school shootings, one of the things that turns up is that almost always some people have indicators that show that this person is in trouble, this young person is in trouble. Um, but very often that kind of communication doesn't necessarily occur because it is so dangerous to report troubled students. I am still having a lot of trouble from the first student that I reported. I will have it probably for the rest of my life. Um, so you don't want to take that on because you often feel as though you have to take it on by yourself. There has to be some kind of infrastructure at universities and at K-12 so that teachers don't feel as though they really are on their own. But you can imagine how difficult this situation is because if you're a parent of the student who is accused of being potentially violent, of course you get very defensive yourself. You talk about litigation, you get very, very um, frightened by it, some do anyway. So we have to start to have really honest conversations about how often we're facing this kind of thing. What we need to do, what kinds of threat assessment teams unfortunately we need in schools. We do have one now at Virginia Tech, a threat assessment specialist, and I think that that's a step in the right direction. But I think that faculty for the most part and teachers are not trained to deal with students like that. You're trained to believe that if you just reach out enough you can somehow communicate with all students. Sometimes that's not the case. And what happens in those cases? The most difficult thing of all though, the thing that's going to plague all of us, is that most of the time the students betray their anxiety or their rage in their creative writing. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is a question that those of us who teach writing composition as well as creative writing are going to have to face in the future. It's not a coincidence that Cho's behavior was noticed in English. It wasn't simply that he was an English major because in fact he was not an English major for a lot of his time at Virginia Tech. It's that the classes were small enough and the writing was personal enough that we began to know something about who he was. We have to make sure classes are still small otherwise we're not going to be able to even communicate with students. But we also have to create venues that allow teachers to report these things without having to suffer the consequences and do things alone. For the most part, I cannot tell you what a lonely feeling it is to wake up each morning and know that you've got to meet with a deeply troubled student because you can he has not threatened to kill anybody. He has not said anything that can possibly make him uh, eligible for being committed. If you had a really together counselling centre, and it seems as though, as you probably know recently, the counselling documents and Cho's medical records were found in the home of the counselling director. Uh, he hadn't realised he had them apparently until just the other day when the lawsuits came to pass. Um, it is possible, by the way, that that's quite true. I know Bob Miller, and, and actually he was, he was quite receptive when I was uh, talking with him about troubled students. On the other hand, it makes it even more difficult for the family members who are trying to find out the truth when all of a sudden this documentation appears. 
I think the one thing we could do at all universities and in all schools is have more open dialogue about the troubles that we're experiencing and then try to come to some solutions using threat assessment specialists and others. One of the things I kept requesting with student A was could we have somebody who knew how to deal with threat assessment. We don't. I mean it's much much harder for those of us who don't and I've, I've taught on three continents, I've taught for you know 30 years but it's still very very difficult to try to communicate with certain kinds of students. But I think unless we begin that national dialogue, unless we talk about guns too, which is the big subject no one wants to tackle, uh, it's, guns are so available right now, people are buying more ammunition than they ever have in history because Obama's in office. Um, the children are getting hold of these things and the young people are getting hold of them and it is so easy, it was so easy for Sun We Cho to get hold of those weapons. We have to make it more difficult because I can pretty much guarantee that unless we take a different attitude towards some of this and unless some of our politicians grow spines and most of them don't have them, then we will be facing the same difficulty that we're facing right now. And our young people can't advocate for themselves necessarily, especially not in K-12. We really have a responsibility then to try to make something happen. Uh, but I do think it is a hard thing to talk about. With Columbine, as you probably know, they've sealed some documents for 27 years. They will not be opened. And that's because people are really afraid to see what's in them. But if we're terrified, how on earth can we turn around to our students and say, you have to go to class? It was in volume two which is the sister, the sister bookstore to the tech bookstore on campus. And in fact, I have to say, the manager was very brave. If this is going to be on YouTube, I, please cut this part out. But he put, a, he put a table there with a display with my books on, which was so brave. I mean, there, there are small gestures of courage, like this is off campus, it's just nearby. But still, it's owned by the university, so it was a brave thing to do. And, and people who, there are many people who pretend they don't see me when I'm coming, for example, people I've known for a long time, but there are others who cross the street to embrace me, which I think is a wonderful thing. How, how brave can you be when you do that? Because cameras are everywhere. And uh, I also have to say that I do think it's been easier having lived and taught in lots of different places, because you realize that some things are just absurd. Like, why would you be silent about something like this? Why would you? Just because someone tells you you have to. You wouldn't, would you? Because your top priority would be campus safety. And this is the thing that has depressed me the most about all of this, apart from the horror of the killings themselves. It is that campus safety must be the top priority. It can't be whether or not you want to keep your job. It can't be whether or not you're afraid of litigation. We're all afraid of litigation. We're all afraid because we're going to lose our jobs. But those in leadership positions in particular have a moral obligation to step forward, just as Governor Kane does, just as President Steger does, um, to say things about this and find out what really did happen. Uh, I think I may have mentioned to you that I wasn't asked any questions by the administration. For the first time, a few weeks ago, I was called by the Office of the Inspector General here at Richmond, so who is writing a new report about what happened with counselling. Hopefully that will be out soon. I, I expected it out some time ago because it seemed to be done in a rush, uh, but I haven't heard anything. And usually those of us who are involved are not permitted to know when things are going to come out. But I hope it will because I think it will say some interesting things about uh, the counselling documents that are not known right now by people generally. That's a really good question. Um, I thought that he was suicidal, that's what I thought. And uh, that's why I called the Cook Counseling Center, spoke with the Virginia Tech Police, called the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, and also Student Affairs, and sent so many emails. 
um, because I really was so worried about him. He seemed to be someone who was completely closed off. There have only been two times in my entire career as a teacher. One was in the spring of that year with student A and the other was in the fall with Sung Wee Cho where I have gone to those extraordinary lengths calling everyone. One of the reasons why I did call people and send emails so much was because I'd learned that at Virginia Tech things can be compartmentalized and people didn't necessarily communicate across the units so it was very important that they did. There's a, there's a passage in here where I'm meeting, I'm due to meet with Sung Wee Cho and I called over to the counseling center and I spoke to someone who's not identified and uh, begged that person to come over to meet with me with Sung Woo Cho because I knew that this was beyond my capability. This was someone who needed to see a psychiatrist. I should say to you that at that time, Virginia Tech had no psychiatrist on staff for the entire university. It had just before that time abolished the Dean of Students office and instead we have the Office of Student Life and Advocacy. In the report, there are so many errors. For example, the Dean of Students doesn't exist, but yet again and again the Dean of Students appears in the report. Can't appear because we don't have that office. Many of us were outraged by that abolition because it seemed to suggest to us that students were not the primary focus. So there are just things like that that, that are not incidental, that have a lot to do with a campus culture that we need to be asking ourselves about. More and more on campuses, we focus now on raising money. We do. And we don't focus enough on student welfare. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's incredibly difficult to, to know whether some of this could have been prevented. If, if Sung Wee Cho was very determined, it wouldn't matter what kind of help he got, perhaps. At the same time, there will be other things we can prevent. So we have to find a way to talk across the horror of this and find a way to help young people so that their classrooms are safe because right now they're not. I know it's 12.54 and I've gone on a long time. Please don't hesitate to ask me questions afterwards. I'll be out there, I believe, signing books. Once again, let me thank the Library of Virginia for having me here today. And Peggy, for your introduction, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for being here today. It's, it's a great pleasure. Um, would, could you use the, uh, the honor of drawing Oh. The name of the person who is my husband, does it count? <laughs> Jim Petter? Petter? Petty? Very good. Congratulations. Um, Professor Roy will be out in the lobby uh, signing books and answering any questions you might have. Thank you all for coming. Please come back and see us again. Um, and uh, enjoy the hopefully improving weather. <laughs>